And like Carl said, my name is Kurt Spokus, and I'm a research soil scientist with the USDA ARS up in St. Paul, Minnesota. So where I wanted to start today was a very brief look at what is actually happening in the biochar area. The slide here shows the overall, the number of publications, if you look through Google Scholar, at, for starting in 2005 through the most recent estimation of what we'll have in 2015. You can see that there's been an exponential growth, and it's even gotten to the point where in 2015, we have an average of 15 papers on biochar coming out every day. That is an awful lot of information for this particular area, and it's even approaching the levels of some of the cancer and medical research areas. So before we get into a talk about biochar, Carl did a very good job of introducing the biochar. And like he said in his introduction, it is the process of making a material for carbon sequestration. We're taking on the left of the slide, you see the biomass materials. If we left them out in the environment, they would degrade in zero to five years. We use this process of pyrolysis, which is just a chemical or thermal modification of the material without oxygen to create black carbon. The sole difference with biochar is that we are producing this with the idea of sequestering the atmospheric carbon in this material. We've been researching black carbon for some time, and it basically is a more recalcitrant form. And we know that it can survive from 50 to maybe even a million years. And so you can see that the major idea here is just extending the time of the carbon's existence. So the major emphasis in my talk today is to look over the history. Biochar, black carbon, or charcoal is the material that we have probably looked at for the longest history of our scientific record. So we start by looking back during the cave drawings. You, there was back 30,000 BC, you can almost envision where one particular caveman would pick up a piece of charcoal and discover, oh, I can do drawings on the wall. Soon after that, there would have been fights over who had this darker piece of charcoal, but we've been using it for that particular purpose for the last 30,000 years. Then came the Egyptians, and they realized that they could take material, particularly reeds, and cook them through the process of pyrolysis and form a liquid and the char products. The liquid, they discovered, had a lot of antimicrobial properties. This was very key to them because part of the embalming for the mummification, they were looking for mechanisms and chemicals to actually extend the life of the material. So they used this wood vinegar for that purpose. There's also the possibility that even the Egyptians, and as Carl mentioned in the introduction, the native Amazonians, might have discovered that this was good for soil but we don't really have any records or cave drawings or anything that suggests that they did this intentionally. It was about 30 to 40,000 BC that we discovered that charcoal was a very good energy source. We've been using that for some time, and in about 3,000, 4,000 BC, the Romans discovered that it was very good for water filtration that if you'd actually pass contaminated or dirty water through charcoal, it was then clean. As you can see, all of these uses we still use today. We use pencils. The, we still use biomass as a source of chemicals and energy. Ever since the 15th century, we've been producing charcoal. And we still use charcoal for our water filtration and activated charcoal filtration that we all use today. So now going through and looking at some of the ancient writings, we first start with the ancient Greeks. Theo Phartros had a book that he wrote in the Inquiry into Plants. It was at about 300 to 350 BC. At that time, charcoal was primarily used for energy and silver mining. But he actually had a very detailed account on the observations of what factors were good and bad for the charcoal at the time. In his writings, he had that the worst woods mentioned in the oak, since it contains most mineral matter, which would be the ash, and the wood of older trees is inferior to younger trees. As for the same reason, charcoal from the really old 
old trees is especially bad. So what they were starting to see was that there were differences in the chemical behavior of charcoals depending on the source of their feedstocks. He also noted that a good charcoal source is if the wood contains a large amount of moisture after drying. The ancient Greeks didn't have any mention at that time that they ever applied this to soil. It was primarily used for energy in, in the mining. When the ancient Romans came around, there were several mentions of charcoal's use in agriculture. In one of the quotes that they had was, in burned vegetables, there are an abundance of salts of vegetables, so they must greatly contribute to enrich the land. In this, they were seeing that since the plants would need the material that the plants had in it, they saw that burning the vegetables to form the charcoal had to be a closed loop or a very good thing. The major use during the ancient Roman times of charcoal was to open stiff lands, or the clay rich soils. There were numerous accounts of them applying this to soil before they would actually attempt to work up the soil for agriculture. However, there were a lot of interesting little side notes to this. You had to keep such mixtures wet. You had to use them sparingly. And it was only to be sprinkled on the ground just prior to harrowing or just prior to the mixing into the soil. So we go from the ancient Romans all the way up until about the 1700s. There was the first major research that was conducted with biochar charcoals was done by Arthur Young in the 1770s. He applied four different treatments of coal ash, charcoal, peat ash, and bone char. And he occasionally saw yield improvements in corn and turnips. And his overall conclusions mirrored the hypothesis of the ancient Romans, that it was composed of plant nutrients, and therefore it must be good for plants. The next major research came in the 1700s from Joseph Priestley. We also know Joseph for his advancement of the concept of photosynthesis. But before that discovery, he actually was focused on charcoal. And he was looking at it primarily for electrical conductivity and for gunpowder production. And during his studies on the electrical properties of charcoal, he discovered that there were significant differences between the same pieces of charcoal that came out of each batch. And so this was really the first realization that the actual chemistry or the behavior of the materials were variable even from one batch of charcoal. He didn't realize it at the time, but these assessment of electrical properties was actually the first measurements of the alteration of redox conditions although they didn't know that at the time. So after the 17th century, then we start getting into the beginning of the 1800s to the 1920s. During this time, it was the gunpowder research years due to the several wars that were going on. And there were a lot of observations mirroring some of the work that the Greeks had, where Charles Monroe in 1885 said that gunpowder is such a nervous and sensitive spirit that in almost every practice of manufacture, it changes under our hands as the weather changes. In this, they were actually summing up his overall experience of examining about 120 different tree species and looking at the charcoal. What Charles was seeing was that the fact that the charcoal can react with oxygen, would react with air, react with moisture, just sitting in the lab as he was examining it. The one thing that is kind of interesting to realize is down on the bottom of the slide is the overall gunpowder reaction. And those that are familiar with the nitrogen cycling will almost see this as a denitrification reaction, except there are no microbes involved in this. So then we get into the 1800s, and this is really where agricultural research started. It was Sir John Laws that actually established our very first agricultural research farm and this was in Rotham Dam in the UK, one of the original treatments that they had back in the 1830s was looking at charcoal. They used a peat charcoal. They didn't specify what rate that they used. And it was observed to increase turnip yield compared to the control plots. I don't know why they didn't continue this treatment. But again, it just was one of the facets where we do have some documented evidence that charcoal was being used. The next major 
writings came from Sir John Lefroy in the 1880s. He was sent over to Bermuda to discover why their produce and why their agriculture was doing better than the, back in Europe. What he did is a very detailed analysis and observations of all of their practices. What he found was one of the things that they were doing was pyrolyzing the waste vegetables and reapplying it to soil. And you can see in the little underlines on this slide that the he actually gives the directions for how to conduct this pyrolysis. As it is slowly as possible, and every effort by covering up the pile to prevent burning and let no more air in than just to keep a smoldering fire. This is basically our fundamental definition of paralysis. And in here he also says that the ashes of all vegetables contained the materials that are needed for plants. And they are very useful for all crops, but then they kind of goes into again a little bit of a specific direction where they lose a lot of their value, although they're kept under cover. And at that time, they actually had a, a application rate of one pound per square yard, or 5,000 pounds an acre, or 5,500 kilograms per hectare. And this is interesting, because we currently don't have any guidelines for biochar application today, even though back in the 1880s, it appears like they were pretty much centered on that type of application rate. So as you go through the literature during the 1800s, we see a lot of instances of improving yields, uh, particularly with peat charcoal. We have incidences of improving oats, getting a two-fold improvement, grasses, getting improved color, potatoes, and corn nearly doubling yields. And this particular study was interesting because at the time, statistics wasn't fully developed. So the yields are actually checked by the neighbor. Uh, we actually have stories of increasing soil temperatures, and this has been documented all the way back to the 1730s. And we have this mixture where charcoal has to be mixed with manures or because it improves our fertilizer action. It also has been documented to reduce plant pathogens back then, where we had one handful of charcoal with each seed to help potatoes and peaches. And we also had the first patent in 1850 for an antiseptic fertilizer. So during the late 1850s to 1920s, we were 100% reliant on biomass for our energy and chemical production. In the US, we had wood distillation plants that actually did this pyrolysis conversion. And if you look at the USA EPA Superfund list, a lot of these wood distillation plants are still contaminated today. So during the 1900s, there was the big advent of a lot of analytical techniques. And they, we made a big advancement in charcoal that we discovered that we could activate it or get it to do our particular sorption by treating it with steam or different chemicals. The interesting part of this is it took 4,000 years from the discovery of the first sorption to actually get the processes to optimize this. Then during 1920, Carl Gassner also made a very critical discovery at the Paris World Fair with the development of a dry cell battery. This is the first documented evidence of charcoal being able to act as a catalyst for redox reactions of cations. And this is the basic reaction that occurs in all batteries still today. And during the 1920s and 1950s, they were purifying a lot of extracts for all these new analytical equipment. During all these studies, they discovered occasional loss of nitrate, of ammonia, of nitrites. And what they attributed to was that the charcoal itself was interacting with the nitrogen. What's shown on the screen is that there's two different interactions. You can either form a soluble salt, which is shown in the top A figure, or it can form an organic amine. The difference is if it forms an organic amine, that nitrogen is removed from the system or the charcoal is acting as a nutrient bandit. So all in all, we have over a 100-year history of looking at microbial interactions on charcoal. Potter in 1908 was the first to discover that fungi degrades coal or charcoal. 
And Galli in 1910 was the first that said, well, in addition to fungi, bacteria can also degrade this. And then during the 1960s to 70s, there was a big focus on all the new agrochemicals that were being produced. And all of the actions of charcoal were linked to sorptive properties. The most major of which occurred in 1955, where Turner discovered that the charcoal could absorb what he referred to as plant putrids. Because at the time, they didn't have the ability to figure out what those chemicals were. And with time, we've actually figured this out, and we've actually used it recently as a protectant for seedlings and to protect them from various agrochemicals. During the 1980s, there was a big push, particularly in Germany, for trying to liquefy black carbon so we could actually transport coal through pipelines. These were led by the discoveries of Fakusa and Cohen and Gabriel in the 1981 and 82 that fungi could actually liquefy it, producing the black liquid or wood vinegar. And then we finally come to the biochar renaissance. About 1985 through the current, we have kind of have this big push that we had a rediscovery that biochar was present in the soil and that could improve fertility. When we look at history, however, the biggest hurdle is economics. Back in the 1800s, they said on stiff soil, it doesn't produce a much yield difference to actually pay for the charcoal. And in 1849, they came up with the conclusion that charcoal depends on circumstances and the cost in many situations is too great to actually allow its use as an ordinary manure or fertilizer. The most interesting story of this was Durden in 1849 when he said, peat charcoal alone doesn't appear to be a value to commemorate its cost, as it will be necessary to reduce the cost of the manufacture of this article very considerably before any extensive applications of it. The one thing to remember is back during 1849, a lot of the women and children helped with the agriculture operation as well as the prisoners. So there really wasn't a high cost because they just burnt this material in the field. So if you really look in detail at the difference between 1849 economics and today in terms of agriculture, farmers were about 70% of the labor force in 1849. Today they're less than 2%. The farmers used to support two people. Now they support over 100. In 1849, farmers received 75 cents a bushel for corn. As of July 4th this year, farmers received $4.28 per bushel of corn. The interesting fact is the dollar in 1914 had the same buying power as $23 in 2012. So this would actually equate to about a $16.92 per bushel price for corn. So we are at a point right now where the pendulum is swinging away from fossil fuels and back to biomass as a source of our energy. We need to understand biochar's mechanisms to fully utilize the chemical, physical, and microbial properties to obtain the anticipated functions. In other words, we need to optimize biochar for a particular use or the concept of designer biochar. The one thing I'll end with today is about how science is tied to observations. This slide kind of summarizes the thing that is very interesting because observations are our key, but our eyes can also be fooled. And with that, I'd like to thank all the students that have helped and assisted with all this research. And that's the real reason I have things to present at these meetings.